This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact, we'll find out how robots give students hands-on lessons in science and technology. Plus, as Dr. Tony Zeiss heads toward retirement, a look back at Central Piedmont Community College's growth under his leadership. And the end is near for a legendary Charlotte Blues Club. We'll take a look back at the history of the Double Door Inn. Don't go anywhere. Carolina Impact starts right now. PBS Charlotte presents Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. Toys have come a long way since I was a kid. Today, kids aren't just playing with robots, they're building them. And they're much more advanced. Carolina Impact's Danielle Koser explains how playing with robots today can actually help shape careers. From evil Megatron. Humans don't deserve to live. To one of the most loved robots in entertainment history. R2, D2, your highness. There was a time robots were best known for their role in sci-fi movies. The iRobot Roomba 980 vacuum cleaning robot. The now they play a role in our everyday lives, blurring the line between fantasy and nonfiction. <laughs> Measuring materials and manufacturing parts, three teams gather under one roof to build robots of their own, preparing for a statewide competition. So we have a 120 pound weight limit and we have six weeks to build a robot. Where their creations battle it out in a game similar to capture the flag. There's defense lines and a tower basically, and by cooperating with other teams, you weaken those defenses by crossing them and there are all sorts of different obstacles. This is the first year students have access to this 10,000 square foot workshop housed at Charlotte Douglas International Airport. As planes take flight overhead, ideas take flight inside. At the beginning of the season, we start with a strategy. There's only a handful of these spaces across the country. To be able to have one in Charlotte is really exciting because it offers them an opportunity to become more competitive. As you're developing your robot, you're prototyping, you can test them out as you go. I feel like we should just cut them so that they're three inches each piece. You're always trying to see how can you improve your team, how can you manage your team, um, where is your team lacking and why is it lacking there. In the world of robotics, each team runs like a business, tasked with the design. We have a CAD team, which stands for Computer Aided Design. Production. The mechanical team is in charge of building the robot. Right here, there's supposed to be a link right here. So the and the programming team, which will program the robot to work. And promotion of the robot. We also have the marketing team, which will work on like our brand. For them to have a space where they know that they can be kids, where they can do what they need to do, that can be noisy run their robots, uh, get excited. That really makes me happy. Then from there, we're going to do robot driving. Leah Schwinghammer runs operations for the Queen City Robotics Alliance, the hub for teams here in Charlotte. The nonprofit prepares students for careers in STEM, which stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I'm hopefully to get um, some kind of job in some type of robotics um, research and development program. This will allow me to really focus on robotics. And the sensors will be looking for the black line on the white background. Bark Cave has always had a knack for designing and building. Legos. Legos were definitely my go-to because they were always modular and they were, you could create about anything. Either go by the instructions or you could free build. Now, as president of Charlotte Area Robotics, he's traded in colored blocks for circuit boards. Bart studies mechanical engineering at UNC Charlotte, hoping to turn his hobby into a career. He's also enrolled in the co-op program at Bosch Rexroth, designed to expand the talent pool for manufacturing companies. It's just an issue right now of supply and demand uh, in our industry. It's, it's tough to find students that are entering the fields that we need for manufacturing. The U.S. Department of Labor predicts just two years from now, 1.4 million technology jobs will be open across the nation, and only about 60% of those will be filled at the current rate of students graduating with degrees in computer science. Bosch started the co-op program three years ago with three students. 
Today, it's grown to 14. It's really amazing how they're not at all scared of what they're doing. They jump right in. They have no fears because they maybe don't know from before. If we need to, we can cut it. Students like Bart earn a paycheck and real world experience. He worked with engineers to design this conveyor system. It kind of starts with an idea in your head and then you rough it out on a piece of paper. You always collaborate with your teammates. It really comes down to the collaboration I get to have with my teammates and knowing new things, learning new things, and how other people think, and I really love that. It's a great feeling. I absolutely love it. It's probably one of the reasons why I stick with this program. Collaborating and creating, teams spend hours working in the warehouse, strategizing and troubleshooting to achieve one common goal crush the competition. Robotics gives students a chance to explore their strengths and different career paths. Gaining hands-on experience, students build their confidence as they immerse themselves in the technology that will help build our future. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Kosa reporting. Thanks so much, Danielle. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, mechanical engineers in the U.S. earn about $82,000 annually. Industrial engineers bring in about the same, while electrical engineers earn around $100,000 a year. Sounds like some pretty good career options to me. Well, the search is underway for the next president of Central Piedmont Community College. Earlier this year, Dr. Tony Zeiss announced plans to retire after holding the title for nearly 24 years. He's only the third president in the college's 53-year history. Carolina Impact's Danielle Koser is back and brings us just a few of his accomplishments. Dr. Tony Zeiss wears a number of hats, literally. As a lover of history, avid sportsman, and community leader. Oh, he's the Energizer Bunny. He's a bundle of energy. I mean, he's always thinking. One of our earlier vice presidents, and I won't give her name, uh, dubbed him Rocket Man. He was tough to keep up with. <laughs> no, he was impossible to keep up with. Amy Gregor's Associate in Arts. After serving as president of Central Piedmont Community College for more than two decades. I'm Tony Zeiss, I'm the president. It looks like life for Zeiss may finally start to slow down. Yeah, you got a long <laughs> way to go to catch up with me. He plans to retire later this year, marking the end of an era. Special assistant to the president, Dr. Kathy Drum, has worked alongside Zeiss for 22 years. I would, uh, you know, sort of jokingly, but not really, say to Dr. Zeiss, I will stay as long as you don't expect me to work as hard as you do. He is 24-7 and seems to thrive on that. One of the largest community colleges in the Carolinas, Central Piedmont serves 70,000 individuals each year. During Zeiss's tenure, the college grew from one campus to six, with the addition of Moroncas in 1990, Levine in 1998, Harper in 1999, Harris in 2001, and Cato in 2002. So when you think about Dr. Tony Zeiss, uh, the word passion just immediately jumps to mind. This is a leader who came to Charlotte many, many years ago with the vision to grow Central Piedmont from the good school it already was into one of the premier deliverers of workforce development training to employers in the economy. He's always thinking, you know, five years ahead. It's not where the system is today, but where are we going with the system? And really, he's very strategic in his thinking. In 2012, the college's commitment to workforce development earned a nod from President Barack Obama. Jackie Bray is a single mom from North Carolina who was laid off from her job as a mechanic. Then Siemens opened a gas turbine factory in Charlotte and formed a partnership with Central Piedmont Community College. Partnering with the Charlotte Chamber of Commerce and other organizations, the college helps bring businesses to Charlotte by offering an educational component to grow their workforce, a win-win. This college has given me so much. I've learned and grown so much. I've had an amazing experience with teachers that gave it their all to teach me something that they loved, hoping that in turn I would love it. I couldn't have made it without the instructors here. A lot of the instructions that they've given me from all the courses I've been able to apply onto what I currently do at uh, Duke Energy as an intern. Um, and I'm looking forward to do even more in the engineering department. And that has a tremendous economic impact. Um, you know, over 99% of the people who come to Central Piedmont leave with jobs 
and many of them or most of them stay in Mecklenburg County. You can't talk about the success of Charlotte's second or third fastest growing city in America without talking about the role that Central Piedmont plays in producing the talent that's required to keep our companies competitive. Zeiss also renewed the college's commitment to the arts with the addition of the Dale F. Halton Theater in 2005. I got to the office one day and Daryl Holland said, Tony Zeiss and I have decided that you're going to give this amount of money for the Halton Theater. I said, oh really? <laughs> Things like that happened. A major contribution by philanthropist Dale Halton helped turn Zeiss's vision into a venue. Today the facility houses theater, music and dance productions. I thought it was about time we did something big for, for Central Piedmont and Tony. Under Zeiss's leadership, the college's annual operating budget grew from nearly $47 million to more than $202 million. Mecklenburg County voters backed the college's mission by approving bond referendums to build new facilities and expand the college's reach. In 2013, more than 72 percent of voters gave the green light to a referendum that brought $210 million to the college. It demonstrates how much trust they have in Tony and his ability to run one of the best known community college systems in the country and what he has brought to this community uh, through those building projects and those programs has really, I think, made community colleges cool. I think he's the guy that made community college cool. The community also showed its support for the college during its five-year Legacy and Promise campaign, which raised nearly $64 million, more than twice its goal. I think the community saw that they had the opportunity to leave a legacy for so many people who passed through the doors of Central Piedmont Community College and a promise that this community made to them that we care about them, we care about education, and we care about what happens to the community at large. Over the last two decades, the college's facility space grew from 1.4 million square feet to more than 3 million, and the number of students attending increased by 60 percent. The physical growth is one thing, and it's wonderful, and it's a great attribute for the city and for our college, but the people who've been touched by that uh, are the heart of it, and, and he would certainly tell you that. One, two, three. An educator at heart, Zeiss holds a doctorate in community college administration, a master's degree in speech, and a bachelor's degree in speech education. He's also authored a number of books on subjects ranging from economic development to the Civil War. He is first and foremost an educator. He did that for many years before coming to Central Piedmont, and I think it allows him to really interact well with the faculty and also to, to continue to lead the college as primarily a service organization for students. Ralph Pitt served on the college's board of trustees for nearly 16 years, spending the majority of those years as a chairman. The one thing about Tony Zeiss is whatever it is he chooses to do, he's all in. And uh, I think that's true of all of his avocations as well as his primary vocation. To me, he's um, one of the most fascinating people I've ever met. He's a can-do person. He's a whatever it takes, we're going to do this and we're going to do it together. Zeiss prepares to step down as president of Central Piedmont Community College, but plans to stay plugged into the community, serving on a number of boards. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Koser reporting. Thanks so much, Danielle. We're so lucky that Dr. Tony Zeiss joins us in the studio right now. Dr. Zeiss, you've been described as the Energizer Bunny we saw <laughs> in that story, and so we're excited to have a little bit of your time. When you came here over two decades ago, did you have it all planned out in your head, the big vision and where you would be today, or has it evolved? And help give leaders some tips to how to, how to have that kind of success in the uh, community. Well, you hit the main point, it's vision. Yes, uh, I'm a great believer in vision. In fact, my whole career is set one big vision after another and, and move forward. Because people, first of all, people feel good about working toward a vision that's sort of bigger than than individuals, uh, and, but collectively you, it can be achieved. And people enjoy that. And if you as a leader give them an opportunity to do something like that, that, that affirms that they are meaningful and they're doing significant things, uh, then they'll love you for it. And at the same time, the institution will have achieved some great things. And so, yes, I knew we had to have a vision because I had taken a look at 
the publications of the college and I knew that they had no strategic plan and they had no vision. And so that I, I knew about that and that's what I worked on as soon as I got here. And we've stuck to that vision of becoming a nation's leader in workforce development uh, all of these 23, 24 years. And to even be recognized by President Obama in 2012, what an amazing accomplishment. Can you even see that? And there had to be a few difficult days along the way. How do you push through that as a leader? Well, if, if you want to create uh, change, which this was, uh, then you have to tie the, the change to a, an existing core value. And so this school was already well known for being an innovative school, so I just tied the vision to innovation. It's not anything new that we're doing. It may be bigger than what we've done in the past, but like always, we're gonna do it in an innovative way. And so that works very well, and that's really pretty much how we did it. And then, yes, uh, a few good retirements helped, <laughs> but, but basically everybody got on board, and it, it's, it's been terrific. I love uh, my people, or our people, and, uh, you, you because know, of that. And that's something very interesting, too. You have, everywhere I've seen you speak, you've always thanked the team, and you've always thanked the people. So even though you've achieved some great accomplishments, I've always heard you to give the praise to others. And that's oh, exactly. Thing. And listen, it was not me. I mean, I, I'm amazed and, and I'm pleased that God put me in a position to be a leader, but it's, it's our folks and it's all about relationships. Once you get the vision, then, then start building the relationships and then set goals that are achievable one at a time and over time they're, they're, they're amazing, uh, the, the things that you can accomplish. You've been an incredible fundraiser too, which is no small task, but does, that seems to be connected to your relationships also. Exactly. It's all about friend raising before you fundraise. People have to trust you. Uh, people give to people. They also give to causes, but they give to people who have good causes. So you get that mix working and then they trust you that you're going to be a good fiduciary um, person with their money. Then you've got a good, uh, a good formula for success. What are you most proud of? I'm most proud of the relationships that we have with each other, with the community, and with our students. It's all about student success and community success. So those two things I'm most proud about. Any last minute words? Now we know you're not really going away. You might not be the president of Central Piedmont forever, but you're going to stay in the community and still be a community leader? Oh, absolutely. Every person, Amy, needs to be doing something that's meaningful. I can't think of anything more meaningful to do than to be helping uh, individuals uh, learn the skills and knowledge to move forward in their careers and helping communities to become prosperous. That's what I'll be doing. Well, you know, we're very grateful for you here at PBS Charlotte because we wouldn't be here if it weren't for your vision and Central Piedmont Community College. So thank you for giving us another chance to survive and thrive and contribute to this great community. Thank you, too. Do you have a high-stress job, or are you just stressed out about life? According to the American Psychological Association's Stress in America survey, money and work are the top two reasons for stress. But for the first time, family responsibilities ranks as the third most common stressor. Carolina Impact's Jeff Reifenbarg shares some techniques that can help us cope a little easier. <music> driving on busy roads and answering endless emails to worrying about paying bills, stress comes at us from all directions. When Susan Smith takes a stroll, she appears to have everything under control, but that wasn't always the case. Life events can cause stress. She's referring to a horrible head-on collision involving her daughter 15 years ago. She had multiple injuries. There were seven surgeons who put her back together. I had to get up every morning and go to work and come home in the afternoon and bathe and feed her because she was at home recuperating the rest of her time for one year. In addition to teaching high school English and caring for her daughter, Susan had a genetic heart condition called mitral valve prolapse, commonly referred to as a heart murmur. 
The stress she was under made her heart condition worse. And I would be teaching, and my heart would go into an arrhythmia. If I feel off, I immediately go take my blood pressure. Dr. Kenneth Weeks specializes in internal medicine, cardiology, and sleep medicine. He says it's important for people to understand how long-term stress wears the body down. And when adrenaline is in your body on and on regularly, it induces other things in the bloodstream, such as cytokines that injure the blood vessel wall, injure organs as they pass through, and those things represent the end stages of bad stress and end up in disease. And it can be chronic, long-lasting disease. From anxiety and depression to digestive problems and headaches, chronic stress creates a domino effect, increasing one's risk for developing a range of health conditions that over time can knock you down physically and mentally. Well, we call that the bi-directional relationship of disease and stress. And that is the more you're stressed, the more disease. As a psychiatrist at Rowan Medical Center, Dr. Samantha Suffren closely reviews her patients' medical records, trying to help them identify stressors, the activities, events, and other stimulus which lead to stress. Stressors can exacerbate or make certain underlying illnesses worse, or it can bring on other things such as panic attacks or anxiety um, if that stressor is not addressed. She encourages patients to create a list of their stressors, and once you see that you can start addressing some of these stressors and doing some form of action towards the stressor, you'll find that the stress response starts to decrease. She says mindfulness or being attentive to what's happening right now is another form of therapy. A lot of our stressors are consumed or occurs in the future. And if you are staying in the present, you can actually appreciate that maybe there's nothing going on right at the moment and allow your heart rates and your worries to subside for that time and enjoy what's going on around you. Good things actually can come out of bad situations. That horrible accident taught Susan how to better handle her stress. Here are some of her favorite techniques. When something upsets her, she reaches for a glass of water and sips it slowly, which increases the blood volume and gives her a boost of energy. Regular exercise helps her body preserve energy. If we would just open our eyes to the beauty around us, then that in itself is calming. And when she has a doctor's appointment, I make it a point to arrive early, to bring something to read. When I walk into a doctor's waiting room, I look for a quiet place to sit. Which reduces the stress she's feeling, lowers her heart rate, and calms her. She's done an active form of some behavior or response to the stressor. Seek help in medical professionals, in psychological professionals, in counseling professionals, and in spiritual professionals to take ownership of what it is we're going through and how best to deal with it. While Susan knows it's impossible to avoid stress completely, now she understands how it affects her health and what she can do about it. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Rivenpark reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. We have more tips to reduce or manage stress on our Carolina Impact page at pbscharlotte.org. Well, finally tonight, they've been playing the blues at Charlotte's Double Door Inn ever since it opened back in 1973. But now, fans of the legendary Live Blues Club are also singing the blues. The Double Door is closing in January after 43 years to make way eventually for a new college academic building at Central Piedmont Community College. Tonight, as part of the Remember When series, Carolina Impact's Jeff Sonier takes us inside one of the oldest live blues clubs in the country. Well, hi, Amy, and welcome to the place they call Charlotte's home of the blues, which actually, yeah, used to be somebody's home. The Double Door Inn starting out as an old house built back in the early 1900s, but since the 70s, well, come on in and see for yourself. The Double Door is sort of a living museum of Charlotte Blues history. Guitarist and singer Rick Blackwell is part of that history. So is percussionist Jim Brock, both original members of Double Door's house band, 21 years ago. So I cut my teeth in this room. I moved to Charlotte when I was 25 years old, and this was the first place I ever played when I moved here. Mr. Roy, you good? 
Mike Martin's been behind the bar at the Double Door for 38 years. We have a lot of fun when we're working. Great bands. I mean, it's like leaving one part of your house and going to your music room and just sitting down. And then there's Joe Cadu over on the dance floor, who's been a Double Door regular for 43 years, since the very beginning. Ever since they opened the door, the second day they opened the door, came in, they had a, a bumper pool table out back where the kitchen is. The wall ended right there at the sound booth. Many, many nights, this place was just shaking and vibrating. People were coming to the bar after. Was that the greatest show? Was that the best? I mean, they were, was that unbelievable? Providing people with musical memory. You know, just having people just say, well, I remember seeing so-and-so at the Double Door. Nick Karras, who founded the Double Door with his brother Matt, says everybody remembers the night Eric Clapton stopped in. Woke up this morning, he ran from a shoe. Well, almost everybody. I missed out on Eric Clapton. I was busy that night. Were you here at Clapton night? Yeah. I waited on him right there. And Clapton got a Coca-Cola, and he probably sat probably in a chair right about there. Sat and listened to the band, and played about six songs. And um, I don't know, it was just, it was just like, we tried to be cool about it, you know? I remember one night uh, on a Monday when we were playing, Tom Jones came in and he sat there in the chair all night, you know? Loved the band, you know, loved the place, didn't feel out of place or anything, you know? And there's been a lot of people like him over the years. And then there was the time blues guitarist Tinsley Ellis played the Double Door, his performance moving from the Double Door stage out to the middle of what was then Independence Boulevard. He'd go out the front door, get on the median, <laughs> and lay on his back. <laughs> he's on the medium on Independence like this, cars driving by, and he's playing on the median there. Which, you know, what do you, what do you think of that? I mean... Hundreds of photos on the walls at Double Door are reminders of other special nights. Remembering blues greats like Leon Russell, Elvin Bishop, Junior Walker. But come January, the Double Door itself will be a memory. You'd be shocked at how many people have been here, played here, and know about this place. And uh, it has a, a special meaning to them. Saxophonist Ziad Rabia shares that message on stage. Because uh, this is one special place that no one will ever forget in the history of Charlotte, North Carolina. I can say that. He's promising the last months of the Double Door will be the best, but maybe also the hardest, especially for those who have been here the longest. You know, my history in this room is pretty heavy. And, you know, it freaks me out to even talk about it going away. I'll be honest, I can honestly say that I really have not thought about it all the way through. Because, I mean, it's a bittersweet, and unfortunately it seems like Charlotte has a history of wanting to get rid of anything that's sort of cool, sort of eclectic, sort of historic. When this place closes, there's never going to be another double. There's no way to recreate what you guys created here back in 73, is there? No, I don't think so. The times have changed and moved on. It'll be sad. You know, it'll be sad. I don't know how we'll actually walk out of here that night. That's going to be hard. And when the Double Door finally does close its doors for good, what happens to all that music memorabilia inside? Well, Nick Karras says he's going to keep some for himself. He's going to give some away. But the rest of it, he hopes, finds a home somewhere where folks can maybe go back and relive some of the music and uh, some of the memories from the Double Door. Amy? Thanks, Jeff. The college says actual construction at the Double Door location is still several years away. But once the college owns the property, state law prohibits operating a bar there. Well, before we go, we want to let you know about the launch of our brand new website, 
On the homepage, you'll find an interactive program guide so you can find out quickly when your favorite program airs on all three of our channels, PBS, NHK World, and Create. In our new kids section, you'll find lots of fun educational games for your kids and grandkids, as well as really cool videos. Please, we hope you'll bookmark the site and visit us all the time to keep up to date on your favorite things here at your public television station, PBS Charlotte. Well, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate your time. and look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. A production of PBS Charlotte.